You know, one of the things I think we Bible prophecy buffs tend to do is think, oh, these are really bad times or they're worse than all the other times. But, but really, when you're also a little bit into history, you realize, well, there's just been a lot of bad times. And there's a lot of centuries and people that thought the end was during their time. And, and you, you know, arguably, I think if you live during World War I, or especially if you're over in Europe or in the trenches, you, you, could, you could think, man, this is the end. No wonder they called it the, you know, uh, the, the Armageddon. That's what they thought World War I was, or the Holocaust of World War II. Um, there's been horrible times in history. And so um, you kind of realize that um, man hasn't changed all that much. There's been a lot of sin and debauchery, but it does say that globally, we'll start to see those things on more of a global scale, not just a localized scale. And that's one of the things that we see in modern days but really, um, Habakkuk lived in scary times. He was one of those guys like Jeremiah and, and like some of these other prophets we've read, I kind of refer to them as end times kind of guys. That's what Habakkuk was. And I think he gives us a great model of what to do uh, if you live in scary times or end times kind of times. Um, what was going on in Habakkuk's day? Well, of course, this was you know, um, Israel being threatened uh, its very existence by the Babylonians. And uh, the Babylonians were knocking at their door and, and um, you know, and, and Habakkuk, well, he's gonna wrestle with this, you know, kind of the, a little bit of the question, why are bad things happening to good people? Um, and then he's gonna kind of answer his own question and we'll see that, but he, um, he's a wrestler. In fact, the, word, the name Habakkuk means wrestler. Some say it means to embrace, but uh, wrestlers do kind of embrace in a strange sort of way. But I, I think it's, you know, the name wrestler sort of fits the bill when it comes to him wrestling with what was happening in the world and what was gonna come down the pike. Um, and so, you know, Habakkuk's ministering during the time when Israel's about to be scattered and taken into captivity into Babylon for uh, those 70 years of captivity. It was a dark and gloomy day. Uh, sin was running rampant through Israel. Um, and there were horrible things happening because of the Babylonians. Remember there were three major waves of Babylonian invasion? Well, Habakkuk's ministry kind of happened in the middle of those waves. And so he saw some of the horrifying things that were happening. If you remember what your Bible tells you, um, during those days, it got so bad, people were starving and women would uh, default to eating their own children. Like cannibalism was happening. Like it, it, it was dark, it was ugly, and it was gloomy. Um, he lived during the 12th and 13th year, or um, you know, this ministry of the, the reign of King Josiah, um, Josiah tried to, if you remember the young king, he started being a king when he was eight years old. Um, but he tried to bring righteousness into the land. He did, did away with all the idols. But one of the things he tried to do is legislate righteousness. Does that ever work? It's a funny thing when you try to legislate righteousness. Um, and really Josiah made a good attempt at that, but um, legislating, you can't just mandate people to be lovers of God, believers in the word. Uh, that's gotta be a hard decision that people make. Keep that in mind, especially some of us maybe that are a little more uh, politically driven, you know, to sort of make a, uh, you know, an argument of why people should believe one way or the other. Um, and I think there's a lot of feudal energy that's put into trying to change people without regeneration, transformation without regeneration. A person needs to be saved. That's the main thing. Um, one of the big mistakes Christians make is we try to clean the fish before we catch the fish. You can't do that. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men and, and we're to go into all the world and preach anti-abortion. No, nope, it's not what it says. Go into all the world and preach anti-homosexuality. Nope, it doesn't say that. The Bible says go out into the, all the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is the transforming work in a person's life. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and that's such a key in our dark and gloomy day as we see sinfulness surrounding, around us and, and we wanna preach against the sin. And there's, there's a place for that, of course, obviously. But at the same time, there needs to be the gospel message. Um, and, uh, and that's an important thing for us to remember. But Israel's in that place uh, of real darkness and Josiah tried to legislate righteousness, but that didn't really work. The people got rid of their idols for a few minutes, but they shortly thereafter got other all, idols all ready to go. And then after you know, Josiah, then came Jehoahaz, remember him? And then after him was Jehoiakim, and this is when, this, these are the kings during the Babylonian you know, uh, invasions. Jehoiakim, of course, was, um, ended up being taken by the Babylonians. 
Um, Jehoiakim, remember Jeremiah went to him with the, the word of God. And what did Jehoiakim do with the word, anybody? He cut it up with a knife and threw it in the fire. Uh, people are doing that today, trying to cut out things of the Bible they don't like and try to get rid of it. Uh, very much the same kind of day as, as uh, you know, these kings, Josiah, Jehoiaz, Jehoiakim, and ultimately with Zedekiah, the last king of Israel before the Babylonians came and wiped out Israel uh, and Judah. But all that to say, just like today, um, you know, this, this prophet sees the problem and he struggles with it. He's wrestling with the problem of the sin of the people, but knowing the judgment is, that's coming. In fact, if you could say there's a singular theme of this book, you might say it's the theme of affliction of God on the people of God. Affliction of God on the people of God. Does God afflict his people? He does, as it turns out. Uh, the Lord will allow us to be afflicted and he does it for our own good. It's not punitive, by the way, it's corrective. Um, if God was gonna punish people for their sins, what would be required? Right, death. People get this confused all the time. When and the Lord allows affliction to the people that go, oh, he's punishing us for our sins. Nope, if you're still breathing, he hasn't punished you for your sins. Um, he's actually allowing affliction not punitively, but correctively. He's, he's using that affliction to correct. And that, this is a big affliction season for the Jews as they are walking in total rebellion, but it's the affliction of God on the people of God. Why? For correction. Um, and it's gonna be a brutal spanking, if you would, that God's gonna give the Jews during this time. And it's gonna be a long-term one. 70 years of captivity, the Jews scattered all over. Uh, it's gonna be a, a big problem. Um, um, now, Habakkuk does something that's unique among all the prophets, and I find it interesting, it's something that's noteworthy, Habakkuk is the only prophet that, doesn't, that God doesn't approach first. All the other prophets, God says, okay, you know, Isaiah, you know, uh, who, who's gonna go for me? And, and Isaiah's like, okay, here I am, send me. Uh, he goes to Jonah, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no, I'm out of here. Pew! And off he goes. Remember that? Like all the prophets, God approached them and, you know, remember Jeremiah? Jeremiah, I want you to be my prophet, but I'm a child. He was 30 years old, <laughs> but I'm a child. I can't do anything. And the Lord says, nope, you're my man. And I want you to preach my word. And, and uh, the Lord called Jeremiah into ministry. But Habakkuk's the only one who never had a, the Lord approach him. He approached the Lord, which is an interesting thing. And I think we can learn from this guy who's in a end times kind of situation. Um, and, and if you're jotting down notes, there's three chapters and there's three main divisions in this book. The first one is we see um, Habakkuk, uh, a wondering and a wrestling. He's wondering and wrestling, wondering what's gonna happen, wrestling with what's going on in Israel. And it's, the, it's kind of the big question mark, wondering and, wet and wrestling, that's chapter one. Then in chapter two, we're gonna see a watching and a waiting where he's gonna watch and wait, even as the Lord calls you and I in these days to watch and wait. Uh, when it comes to Jesus talking about the end times over and over, Jesus, watch, be ready. Um, be the watchman on the wall, the Bible talks about. And you know, that's one of the reasons we do prophecy updates, by the way, because we're supposed to watch when it comes to the end times, the times and the seasons, the signs of the times. The Bible says the church should be aware and not be ignorant of those things, sadly. Um, the church often is ignorant of these things. A lot of churches avoid Bible prophecy like the plague. Um, and they say it's too divisive, nobody can understand it, so they just avoid it altogether. Big goof. Um, by the way, uh, one of the things, uh, one of the um, authors in our church, great uh, author, wrote a, an article um, about the churches that are um, really blossoming during this last couple of years of pandemic and isolation. And while a lot of churches are failing, um, there, there are some churches that are busting out of the seams. And, um, and one of, there's a couple things that we're seeing. One is the churches that are talking about Bible prophecy are, are blossoming and being fruitful and, and people are piling in the doors. Um, another thing I've observed is um, verse by verse through the Bible teaching. People are hungry for that in these days. Um, if you're a pastor out there and you're listening and you're wondering why are people piling in on a Wednesday night at Athey Creek and there's no room in the parking lot left. Um, the reason is because we're all hungry for the word. We want more of the scripture. We wanna see in the days we're living, there's nothing that brings comfort in days like today 
than when we're in the word together. It's, it's what people need. People need the word of God. It's, it's settling. It's a foundation in shaky times. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things. And that's one of the things we're gonna see Habakkuk do. He's, he starts out with a, you know, a, a wondering and a wrestling, but then he, he's in the middle, he's watching and waiting. Wise is the believer who watches and waits. Then the third chapter, we'll see a worshiping and a witnessing. And we'll, uh, we'll visit that one again when we get to chapter three. So in chapter one, you might even ask that question. If God is love, then why do bad things happen to good people? Does anybody remember the answer to this? There are no good people. That, that's a simple answer uh, to say the least. Um, people make a mistake assuming that we're all, we're such good people, you know, there's good in all of us. There's so many stupid songs about that. Can I just say, watch out for stupid songs. There's good in all of us and, and, um, and you know, love yourself. Oh, that's just ridiculous. Love yourself. The Bible says no man ever hated his own flesh. Uh, we have a problem with too much self-esteem. Uh, all of us. Well, Brad, even what about a person who's depressed? They're very self-centered. It's all about me and my bro. Get, we gotta get ourselves off of ourselves. Forget about ourselves. Look to Christ. Um, the Bible tells us over and over this kind of stuff. And, and it, it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's what's true. Um, but this idea of, um, you know, uh, if God is love, then why do bad things happen to good people? False premise right there. There are no good people. Um, we're gonna kind of see that here. And that's what Habakkuk's gonna do when he, when he starts off with his first thing here, uh, a wondering and a wrestling here in chapter one. So here we go, a wondering and a wrestling chapter one. It says in verse one, it says the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Does this sound like another time in history, in the world today? This is exactly what's happening today. People should put Habakkuk right up there with the owner's manual for 2022. I mean, when you read this, this description here is exactly what's going on in our culture. Um, do you feel a little bit of a burden when you kind of think about what's going on in the world today? Um, that's what Habakkuk said. Man, he says, he says the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. This is the first thing that initiates Habakkuk's ministry. It's not the Lord saying, who will go for me? Whom shall I send? Wasn't that, that, that was Isaiah. It wasn't the Lord saying, come on Habakkuk, I need you to go and be my mouth. That was Jeremiah. Habakkuk comes to the Lord and says, Lord, I feel burdened by what I'm seeing. And this is what initiates Habakkuk's ministry as a prophet. Um, and notice the things here, the, you know, there, there was iniquity and unrighteousness with the people. Um, in, in fact, he says, you know, uh, he says there's violence. Uh, again, interesting, in the book of Habakkuk, he uses this word. Does anybody remember what the Hebrew word for violence is? Hamas which is funny, that's kind of an interesting sideline, Hamas in the Hebrew. Now, is that why the green scarved wearing uh, Hamas down in the Gaza Strip call themselves Hamas? No, they're not using the Hebrew, uh, but it is an irony that the Hebrew word for Hamas is, uh, is violence. That's uh, the word Hamas is violence in the Hebrew. And he's gonna use this all throughout his book because the people have become more violent. Um, against each other. And this is some of the stuff he was witnessing, uh, a, a Jew on Jew crime kind of stuff. Um, and he says the violence has happened. Um, and, and he also talks about how the law, therefore, in verse four, is slacked, slacked. Um, if you look that word up in the Hebrew, it can also be uh, translated as paralyzed or stunned, like not really able to do anything about crime. Isn't it interesting that we're uh, dealing with um, violence and crime today, especially those of us that live here in the Portland area, crime is on the rise. 
Um, we have a lot of great law enforcement officers here at Athey Creek. I'm so thankful for our law enforcement. And um, especially, I kind of think you're nuts. If you're a law enforcement officer in the Portland area, some, there's something crazy about you. I'd move to like Montana or something where they actually appreciate law enforcement. Uh, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful there's some crazy people still willing to hold down the fort here in Portland because it's bad. Crime is bad in Portland. Um, and you know, like some of our law enforcement officers I've talked to are saying, yeah, don't even try calling. If somebody comes onto your property and is stealing stuff, don't even try calling the cops. There's no time. There's not enough officers really to go and, and deal with those kind of things. And we've experienced that here at Athey Creek. We had some people come and they were um, sad to say some meth addicts that were um, continually stealing stuff from our property here. And we'd have video and license plates and we had everything we needed, but the law enforcement, yeah, we know these guys, they're always, you know, and if we arrest them, they're gonna be in, out tomorrow stealing something the next day. And there's really nothing, it's kind of, we, we were told, there's a story I probably shouldn't tell about that, but um, <laughs> one, of, one of our guys said, hey, you know, we understand, we, we know you guys are busy, we'll just take care of it. We know where they live, we know what's going on. He, he was kind of joking, but the lady on the law enforcement line was like, oh, no, you guys shouldn't do anything. We'll send an officer out. Um, it was kind of a funny <coughs> little exchange there. But, um, you know, one of our golf carts was stolen. We, we, uh, <coughs> we found it in the bushes a mile down the road, so we brought it back. And, and, um, and then we put our batteries, we took the batteries out of the golf cart and hid them. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you where we hid them because <laughs> maybe some of you are the ones who stole it. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, but they came back, found the batteries where we hid them, reinstalled them and drove off with another golf cart. Uh, <laughs> and this is all with the law enforcement knowing their license plate numbers and faces and we have pictures and everything. It, it, it's just, it's funny. I mean, that's, that's kind of nothing crime now. That's just, oh, they're just getting their meth supply for the next week, which is tragic and heartbreaking. But you know, that's nothing compared to what's going on violence in, in uh, Portland. Did you see the, um, the you know, if you follow it, uh, homicides are at record pace right now in Portland, Oregon. Um, this is from last month, so it's not even up to date. But um, coin uh, article there uh, from Portland, Portland homicides on record pace um, in, um, in 2022. Um, all that to say, uh, Portland is already on track to surpass last year's record-breaking homicide rate. 2021 was totally smashed all homicide records, but we're well ahead of that in 2022. Um, murders are up 10% from 2021 um, as uh, the progressive policies of America's most woke city struggle to curtail violent crime. This is not a pastor talking, this is coin six. Um, uh, talking, which is interesting, saying the progressive policies of America's most woke city struggle to curtail violent crime. Um, uh, the Pacific Northwest bastion topped off uh, fr February with 22 murders so far this year, up from 19 in 2021. This is on track to hit around 130 homicides uh, by de December. Um, you know, other stuff that's horrifying, every 1,000 reported sexual assaults, 995 of the 1,000 will walk free and only one third usually of those, uh, of, of those kinds of crimes are even ever reported. So like sexual crime is at a feverish level. And, and this, this word here, therefore the law is slacked or paralyzed, it can do nothing. That's what Habakkuk says. And that's what we're seeing in our, um, in our world, violence uh, in America, um, out of violent crimes in America, out of 1,000 violent crimes, only 2.5 violent crimes will be brought to justice. Um, so, you know, it's interesting how, you know, our laws really don't scare anybody anymore. I mean, people go and smash and grab and, you know, you might get a slap on the wrist, but you'll be out on the street again the next day if you go and uh, smash and grab a jewelry store or whatever. Um, capital offense, uh, if you are in death row for your crime, the average time uh, spent uh, um, from sentencing to execution is 227 months, almost 19 years before the death penalty would be carried out. And they'll have spent $1.2 million on that single person. Uh, man, just give them the money. Uh, don't murder anybody. Like, it'd be nice to have no crime and they could earn a good living, $1.2 million. Uh, that's how much it costs just to kind of house them in our prison system uh, in those 19 years while they're waiting death, death row. It's, it's a strange uh, system that we have. Whatever happened to the right of you know, a speedy trial? 
Um, I've seen some of these local trials years, years and years go by before anything is ever really done. But we're, we're watching violence, we're watching crime uh, on the rise. And that's really what Habakkuk sees, uh, the violence, the crime. He says, violence is before me and those that raise up strife, strife and contention, tension, therefore, verse four, he says, the, the law is slacked or paralyzed and judgment doth never go forth. That's exactly where we are. Um, Boy, it's interesting, you know, just watching what's happening even in the Supreme Court and seeing some of the interviews, you know, and who our next Supreme Court justice, everybody's holding their breath with Clarence Thomas being sick. Uh, like, oh no, what's gonna happen there? And I mean, people are, uh, the Supreme Court uh, of our United States largely is gonna define where our nation is with a lot of these laws and what's happening in our world and our country. I think we're living in perilous times. It's, it's an interesting day. But um, notice it says the last phrase, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. We're seeing wrong judgment happening in our world, just like in, in his day. Um, it's interesting because um, it's not just uh, lawlessness, but it's also the idea of iniquity. Sinful stuff is going on. Um, and that's what he's talking about, about those that will sin and do wickedly, verse four. Um, judgment never goes forth and wicked does compass. Do you ever feel surrounded by wickedness? Um, you know, it used to be not that long ago, I can remember at least as a kid, um, when Disney was safe. Uh, boy, this week, Disney has shown its ugly side. Uh, I'm not a big banning of, a fan of banning things and that rarely works, but um, as much as I loved Disney in the past, uh, I have to say they've lost their marbles. They have for a long time. Uh, it's, it's been hard to admit it. Um, but, um, you know, did you guys see some of the stuff that's come out even the last couple of days? Uh, Disney corporate president, Carrie Burke, says, as the mother of one transgender child and one pansexual child, she supports having many, many, many LGBTQIA characters in our stories and wants a minimum of 50% of the characters to be LGBTQIA and racial minorities. Isn't it interesting they always try to throw the racial minority in with that other group? Like to me, that's, if I were a racial minority, I would be really offended. I'm not easily offended, but I would be. If they're trying to throw me into that LGBTQIA, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever, uh, I, I, it's hard to keep up with the latest you know, um, uh, acronym, but, um, it, it, the, another uh, Disney's diversity inclusion manager, just that title should give a little red flag for you. Dis Disney's diversity and inclusion manager, Vivian Ware, says the company has eliminated all mentions of ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. So when you go see the fireworks down there, they don't say that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. That's now retired uh, because it marks uh, gender discrimination. Um, so they're gonna talk about uh, that magical moment uh, for children uh, who do not identify with traditional gender roles. I forget what they're gonna say. Um, dream seekers or whatever, something like that. Uh, uh, you know, whatever. Um, now, you know, Oregon, we're, we're at the front of this whole movement of gender and all this stuff. Um, you know, DeSantis uh, signed an interesting law, you know, there in Florida that was basically just saying this. It was saying, we don't wanna be teaching sexuality and issues of transgenderism and, and homosexuality and stuff that's sexual from kindergarten to, what was it, third grade? Third grade. Um, so, you know, that's pretty reasonable if you ask me. Like, we shouldn't be talking to kindergartners uh, and uh, up to third graders. I would raise that up uh, much, much higher than that, but, but um, good, good for DeSantis. But you know, our uh, Oregon governor uh, you know, put her rebuttal out there and uh, Governor Brown, she, uh, she was quoted yesterday. Um, uh, she said, Oregonians are welcoming our LGBTQIA community members. We wanna make sure that Oregon is a safe, inclusive and welcoming place for all. Um, and she said that sort of in, in I should have got the video clip because you just kind of have to watch that to really uh, get the vibe. But, um, but um, she, she said, you know, she was responding to this, what she called the don't say gay bill. Now this is what they're calling DeSantis's bill um, that has nothing to do with don't say gay. That's just the critics um, basically saying, don't, they're, they're, they're saying don't say gay. No, they're saying don't talk to 
kindergartners through third grade about uh, gender identity and sexual things. They're not ready for that, they're not old enough. Um, but all that to say, there's sort of a battle brewing right now about how uh, young children should be indoctrinated by these people with an agenda. Well, Brett, who are you to say uh, you know, that homosexuality and all this gender stuff is wrong. It's not me, it's the book of Romans chapter one. Uh, there are six places in the Bible uh, that talk about this. Um, uh, Romans chapter one, verse 27, uh, 24 through 27. It says, and this is the ESV, I like, this is a little more uh, modern, which is helpful. Therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Now pause for a second. Isn't it interesting that God says, I made them and I made them male and female. He, he's the one who knows biology, by the way. Um, for, for those of you who have been watching the Supreme Court thing. Uh, I'm so glad God knows that because he said male and female, did he create them? Um, and, and you know, it's interesting because I think one of the reasons people love to say, no, there's not male and female because it flies in the face of what God says about his creation. Um, that's why they're willing to just totally ignore biology altogether because they don't want to acknowledge the creator and the way he made us. And so he's saying, we're going to, they're all saying, we're gonna go uh, aside from God and do it the way we wanna do it. And it's just rebellion, that's all it is. So verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Um, man, you know, uh, where are we as a nation? We're just like in Habakkuk's days where people were just doing things in total rebellion against God. Um, and that's the sad truth of what, what the Bible is, says. So injustice, inequity, sin, uh, the law was paralyzed and wasn't able to do anything about it. You know, I read um, a person talking about, um, you know, society, and this comes from like back in the 1940s when they said this. Um, they said, if an organism or a country cannot deal with its infection quickly and effectively, it will die of the infection. And I think we are infected with sin. We're seeing that like Habakkuk's time. God saw that with the Jews during that time. They were infected just as a nation in those times. The Lord says, time's up. Like this Romans 1, 24, God gave them over to, there's a point where God says, I will not always strive with man. Remember Genesis 6 talks about that. So God gave them over and that's what he's doing in Habakkuk's time. That's what he will do globally in the end times. So Habakkuk does sort of parallel um, God's plan, not just for the Jews, but for the whole world eventually. So Habakkuk is very contemporary. Um, but all that to say, um, this is all part of Habakkuk's, you know, uh, wondering um, and wrestling with this topic of what he sees. So, so he, said, he, he asks the question sort of rhetorically, but in verse five, God answers. And he says there in verse five, behold ye among the heathen and regard the wonder marvelously and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. <laughs> the Lord's saying, Habakkuk, you're not even gonna believe what's gonna happen. Um, I, th I think that's kind of interesting. Like you wouldn't believe it if I didn't tell you this, Habakkuk. Um, I wonder if that's the way it is for end times as well. We wouldn't believe uh, unless the Lord told us in his word. I, I think it's amazing to watch as a Bible prophecy student, it's amazing to watch Bible prophecy unfold right before our very eyes. You wouldn't have believed it unless the Lord so clearly wrote it in his word. That's why so many people are missing out on all the interesting um, excitement of the days we're living because they don't know their Bibles prophetically. Um, there's a whole section of the church of Jesus Christ that says all prophecy is already wrapped up. There's nothing new in prophecy and there's nothing to be fulfilled. Like some people are just done saying prophecy is fulfilled. It all happened in AD 70, which is really painfully off, but they're missing all the good stuff that's going on right now. Like, like that's the only thing that makes this kind of fun. Seeing what's going on in the world going, wow, the Bible said that's gonna happen. Um, and we shouldn't be shocked. And it also gives us comfort. Jesus said, when you see these things, don't be troubled by these things. Don't let these things trouble you. 
Uh, and, and I love that. It gives us comfort in confusing times. Um, I love that. So God says, you're not gonna believe what I'm about to do. By the way, sometimes the Lord doesn't reveal stuff to you. Um, and I think he does that so that we'll continue just to trust in him. Can you imagine if the Lord showed you everything that was gonna happen in your life to every detail? You're, you know, you're a 10 year old girl and the Lord shows you who's your husband's gonna be. What would you think about that? Um, is it when he's young and handsome or when he's uh, you know, older and fat? Like when, when does the Lord reveal that to you? Oh, that's gonna be my husband <laughs> or my wife. Um, like I think the Lord purposefully uh, keeps us ignorant on certain things uh, because I think we'd freak out. But that's kind of what the Lord's saying here. He's saying, man, you're not even gonna believe what's gonna happen, Habakkuk, um, though it be told you. In other words, um, God doesn't tell you what he's doing until he's really ready to tell you. That's, that's what verse five saying. And then verse six, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. That's um, the name of another name for the, the Babylonians. That bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. In other words, they're gonna rely completely on themselves. Verse eight, their horses are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall uh, sup up as, they, uh, as the east wind and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings and princes and shall scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold for they shall heap dust and take it. Um, then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. So what's going on here? The Chaldeans, that's the Babylonian army. That this is a description of what God would do, allowing the Babylonians to go through and wipe out uh, Judah and the people of Israel. Uh, remember the, the Northern 10 tribes were already wiped out by this time by the Assyrians, if you recall. So really the main army that we're talking about is the army of Babylon is gonna take the Southern tribes of Judah. Um, but basically this would have been horrifying language for them. Um, it's interesting because again, in the days we're living, we're, we're talking about stuff that is so appropriate for what he's saying. You know, the horses are gonna be swift as leopards in modern times, you know. Uh, it's interesting when we talk about modern weapons, you know, um, we're talking about these supersonic missiles that apparently uh, Putin has, and maybe the Chinese, these hypersonic missiles. And we're still um, trying to develop that, I think, um, and get, maybe getting close to having our own version as the United States. But, you know, talking about weaponry, well, their weapons are swifter than ours. It's still a lot about speed, isn't it? Um, just, like, just like in this, you know, their horses are like leopards. That would have been a horrifying thing. They've got really fast horses in those days. To us, we're like, that doesn't matter. But about how fast are their tanks? Um, you know, it's interesting uh, because this, one thing about this war in Ukraine right now is people are wondering, maybe we shouldn't have been as afraid of Russia as, as we have been all these years uh, because of what's happening. But who really knows? There's so many questions about what's going on there. Um, uh, but, uh, but it is interesting that um, Putin doesn't seem to be as effective, at least with ground warfare, as uh, even air warfare is, it doesn't seem as effective as we all thought. Um, and, uh, and the Ukrainians are stepping up and uh, repelling. And it's kind of an interesting thing. We, uh, it, it's not, the world is shocked right now because it's not going the way everybody thought it would go. Uh, good, bad, or ugly, it's, it's all, it's all uh, not going the way. They, but, but this is something the Lord says, but you can count on this. The Babylonians are gonna be swift and they're gonna be accurate. Their arrows are gonna be on the mark and uh, they're gonna fly like eagles, it says here. So this is talking about scary military advancement by the Babylonians. Um, the Bible talks about military weapons of the last days and how they're gonna be horrible as well. And we're seeing that, the invention of horrible weapons. But, um, but um, all that to say, verse 12 goes on. It says, um, but, it says, but thou art, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God? Um, this is again uh, Habakkuk. Um, mine holy one, 
We shall not die, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Um, you know, it's, it's like, um, you can almost hear Habakkuk saying, but the Babylonians are the bad ones. They're the ones that should be corrected, not us. You almost hear Habakkuk saying that. But um, the answer to that is both need to be corrected. And, and if you read your scriptures, the Lord's gonna use Babylon to crush Judah. We know that. But what happens after the Lord uses, um, you know, Babylon to crush Judah? What happens to the Babylonians? Then they get crushed and that's the Lord. The Lord says, I will crush them. So really, um, you know, Habakkuk's wondering, what's gonna happen to them? And the Lord's, he's got a plan. We know that from other books of the Bible. Verse 13, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. They take up all of them with an ang the angle um, or like an angler, a fisherman. Um, for you fishermen, this should be your life, your life verse right here, verse 15. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net, gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Um, um, it's interesting because this fishing analogy, it's, it's like they're gonna just gather up fish um, as a fisherman. You know, um, when you catch a fish, it's, it's, it always kind of cracks me up because I used to catch a lot of fish when I was a kid and I lived right on the Applegate River and we, we'd catch our limit every day. Um, it, was, it was amazing, this little rainbow trout out of the Applegate. But um, as a kid, I remember always wondering what goes through a fish's mind? <laughs> you know, you're just swimming along, you see a shiny thing, and you bite it, and then, whoa, oh, fight, 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 fight. He's a fighter, fighter, whoa, fight, fight, put up a fight. And, um, and then all of a sudden you're out in a world you know nothing about and you can't breathe. And there you are in some weird things looking at you and you know, getting the hook, you've got a new pierced lip. Um, and, and, then, and then sometimes they throw you back and then you swim off, you're like, what was that all about? <laughs> you know, like, oh, I remember thinking about that, but, but, um, but you know, it's, it's like that. That's, that's basically what the, the Lord is saying, you know, and through Habakkuk, that, you know, it's like, they're just gonna reel you in. They're gonna take you in like a fish and you're toast, you're gonna be done. Therefore, verse 16, uh, they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense to their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat is plenteous. Um, shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Um, you know, basically Habakkuk here is struggling with God, um, choosing Babylon to correct the Jews. He doesn't really like that. He's, he's, it's almost a little bit like, why are you gonna allow them just to reel us in like fish? And they don't even need us. Uh, they don't need, even need our stuff, but they're gonna take us and they could care less about who we are or what we're doing. That's kind of the idea he's, he's saying. Um, but we need to sort of reflect on that idea of why, um, why do the wicked prosper? That's, that's a little bit like what Habakkuk's asking here. Why are you gonna let the Babylonians prosper over your people? The answer we know is he's correcting his people. But it is interesting because that's something you and I see. Why do the wicked, wicked prosper? Um, and the answer is probably best stated in Psalm 73. Would you keep your finger here and flip over to Psalm 73? Um, because there in the Psalm, it gives us the answer about this. Um, psalm 73, one, this is a Psalm of Asaph, by the way, who was a worship leader in the Bible. Um, but in Psalm 73, one, truly it says, God is good to Israel, even to such of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well near slipped. He says, man, I'm, I'm stumbling on this. For verse three, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. You know, we see that today where the wealthy or the powerful, the political, you know, we see, we see the, the, you know, some of the people that have power and money, like some of our political leaders, they've got escorts and security and fences built around their compounds and their houses. Meanwhile, those same people are saying, we don't want fences on our border and you can't carry firearms and stuff. Like there's this funny dichotomy. It's like, the, 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 and the, why do the wicked prosper? Um, and I see they're all firm and they're all safe and sound while we're 
suffering. That's the idea of what the, the psalmist is saying. We're in trouble, but they're not in trouble. Verse six, therefore pride comes about them as the chain. Violence covers them as a garments. Their eyes stand out with fatness. Their eyes are popping out because they're so full of food. Um, and um, and uh, they have more than their heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly. Man, I think of Hollywood uh, when I think of this um, and what's going on so much in Hollywood. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, this, his people return hither <clears throat> and waters of full cup are wrung out to them. Um, you know, uh, in verse 11, they say, doubt of God, no. And is there knowledge of the Most High? In other words, you know, they're, they think God can't really see them. And he goes on and says, man, these people are ungodly who prosper. And he's, he's whining, why do the wicked prosper? But he comes to the conclusion um, when he goes into the sanctuary, verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction how they are brought into desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved when I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant I was as a beast before thee. The psalmist ends by saying, oh man, I, I was a beast. I was wicked in hating the wicked that are prospering. Do you get to a place where you hate the wicked? Because you're like, oh, those Hollywood people, the Hollywood elites or the political you know, people that think differently than I do. And you, you think, why Lord are the wicked prospering? Why are they making so much money? Why are they living in their mansions and with all their money? And, and here I am trying to live for the Lord and I'm suffering. Like that, the, the psalmist realized that's wicked thinking right there. And when he came to his senses, it was when he went into the sanctuary. That's always a good place to be because uh, that's where the Lord speaks to us. And, and there in the sanctuary, he, he said, but then I understood their end. It, it looks like they're standing on firm ground, but they're really not. They're standing, the Lord puts them in slippery places. And that's really kind of something that I think um, we see today. I think, you know, just some of the things maybe you saw in the Oscars, the slap heard around the world. Um, that's just evidence of people just being stupid. Um, the wicked that are prospering and all their wealth and power and glory and the whole Oscars is just a great display of Psalm 73. It really is. And there's a reason why a lot of the world's like, yeah, whatever, we don't watch it anymore. You know, they cut, like, for, there used to be like 40 million more viewers on Oscars than there were um, last, uh, what, what is it, a couple nights ago um, because nobody cares anymore. But all that to say, um, the sad thing is, is when we come to our senses, like the psalmist, we realize how tragic that really is. We should rather than being, why are they so prosperous and so angry at them? Maybe we should be a little more compassionate realizing a lot of those people are going to hell. That's, that's what the, the Lord says to the psalmist here. Asaph at the end says, ooh, man, my thinking is wicked. He says, my heart was grieved when I was pricked in my reins because foolish was I and ignorant. I was like a beast before thee. Don't be like a beast before God and um, be angry because the wicked are prospering. Um, that's a little bit where Habakkuk finds himself. Back to Habakkuk. Um, he finds himself sort of wrestling with why do the wicked prosper? Why are you gonna let the Babylonians who are horribly wicked people come and prosper against the Jews? And he's struggling with that. <clears throat> but the hope is that they would you know, turn from their wicked ways. That's what he's sort of hoping. Um, but when you wrestle with something, um, you know, when you're wrestling with issues, what should you do? Well, Habakkuk does the right thing. Chapter one, I already told you, is a wondering and a wrestling. We've already seen that. Um, uh, but chapter two is where he's gonna do the right thing. What do you and I do when we get frustrated and, and we're wrestling with things that are going on in the world today? What should we do? Well, go from wondering and wrestling to number two, watching and waiting. Watch and see what the Lord's doing. Wait upon the Lord. And that's what we're gonna see here in chapter two. Look at verse one. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Um, interesting, 
um, uh, who, Bible question, who's the shortest man in the Bible? Well, an astute person would say Zacchaeus, he was a wee little man. But a good Bible student would say, no, 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 it's Nehemiah, Nehemiah. But a real Bible scholar would know that it's Habakkuk because he stood up on his watch. So, <laughs> little, little, uh, little Bible uh, commentary for you there. <clears throat> I will stand upon my watch. <clears throat> Verse one is loaded with good stuff that he's doing. Notice um, there's, there's a list of things I'd like you to see. Number one, I see in verse one, a determination. He says, I will stand upon my watch. Um, it's not like, I think I'm gonna just check it out and sort of investigate. No, nope, I'm gonna stand up on my watch and watch and see what the Lord's gonna do. I love that determination. Hopefully when you're struggling with stuff that's going on, don't just kind of half-heartedly seek the Lord, but stand upon the watch and be ready, watching, waiting with determination. I love that. Number two, we see him not only determination, but isolation. Where does he go? He says, I will stand upon the, uh, my watch and set me upon the tower. The tower was that place where he would be isolated away from everything else, up and away looking and watching with a determination. Um, sometimes it's good to get away and seek the Lord. And that's kind of what we see Habakkuk doing, isolation. Um, do you ever get away? Jesus saw fit to get away uh, and, and I, that makes me marvel. If anybody could have pulled it off without getting away, Jesus was the one. But isn't it amazing that Jesus had to get away and seek the Father? He'd go and pray off by himself in isolation. And we see that with Habakkuk. So you got number one, determination. Number two, isolation. Um, number three, expectation. He uh, was expectant to see something happen. He says, I will watch to see what he will say unto me. There, it wasn't like, I hope he talks to me. Nope. I'm gonna watch and wait until he actually says something. I'm not going anywhere. I love his expectation. I think sometimes we, don't, we lack that posture of expectation when we come to church or when we seek the Lord or when we're in prayer. Um, I think that when we're in prayer, that's one of the greatest times to expect the Lord to give you clarity about what you're supposed to be doing or what you should not be doing. Um, Prayer is one of the great ones. I think Bible study like this, the Lord does that, but I think maybe even more so in prayer when you, when you hear um, what the Lord is gonna tell you to do. Uh, a posture of expectation. I hope you have that. Habakkuk does. He says, I'm gonna stand on my watch, go up to, to the tower, isolation, but then I'm gonna wait until you speak to me. Expectation. And then thirdly, we see uh, patience. He's willing just to wait. The, the, the idea of waiting, some of us are not so good at that. Are you a patient person? Or are you a short-term uh, impatient? Uh, standing watch at the gate is kind of the idea, a watchman on the wall, that's patience. Um, it's funny how my dad taught me stuff when I was a little kid, um, because I think it was, I, I used to think it was just the, the work that he wanted me to do, but I think it was actually, there was moments he was really trying to teach me just to be a faithful, you know, patient person. One, there was one time my dad, we had a, a job site and, um, and my job was singular. There was this, this job site we were building. I was just a kid at the time. I was probably like seven. And my dad said, Brett, your job is to stand at this gate at the end of the driveway because um, there's about two or three times today where a lumber truck's gonna come and deliver lumber. But we have to keep the gate closed because there's cattle in this property. So the gate's gotta stay closed. You have to stand here all day um, and wait for the lumber truck. Now this was way up on Upper Applegate Road, which it's a dead end. It ends up in California where you can't go anywhere else. It's like a, there's not an end, like there wasn't a lot of traffic on that road. And I was just out there sitting there waiting for the Jacksonville lumber truck to come in just two times that day. And I got really bored, but I was supposed to be there guarding the gate, watching for the truck, which it did come, but a whole day. So what I did is I realized there was all this milkweed over on the side of the road and I found all these little yellow and black caterpillars and I started collect, collecting them. And um, so, so this is a true story. I, I made a sign uh, during my morning break that said caterpillars for sale. <laughs> and, and I set a little table out and a chair and I was there uh, trying to you know, make, redeem the time, right? I mean, I was guarding a gate and I was selling caterpillars. The problem with my business plan there was A, um, there wasn't a car all day that drove by. <laughs> That's the first problem, except for the Jacksonville lumber truck. 
Um, the second thing was um, nobody wants caterpillars, uh, as it turns out. Uh, but um, but the Lord, uh, I think the Lord used that as a little kid, teach me patience. I had to wait for the lumber truck all day long. And uh, when it came, I was ready, you know, get up and open the gate, you know, and, and my dad rewarded me at the end of the day for my labor of waiting uh, for the lumber truck all day long. Um, sometimes I wonder if the Lord has you wait to teach you patience. Um, could it be the Lord saying, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm, there's not gonna be much traffic here and you're gonna be sitting around thinking you're just wasting your time, but I want you to learn to wait because those who wait on the Lord, the Lord says, I will renew your strength. This is what the Lord will do. Um, so uh, that's what I see here. I see him, de the determination, isolation, expectation, patience, but then also check this out, open-mindedness to the Lord. Um, check out the very final phrase there. He says, um, I will stand upon my watch, set upon the tower, will watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. What did he say there? That's, that's a phrase you kind of blow off at the end of the sentence there. That, that I will, I, what I, I'll know, uh, he'll say what to, to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. In other words, if I'm off course, the Lord's gonna give me a word of correction and I'm gonna receive it. That's the idea. Are you a person that's open to correction of the Lord? Um, let, me, let me ask that a little more pointedly. Are you a person that when someone the Lord gives a word for you and it's a word of correction, are you good at receiving it? Because some of you are not good at all at receiving correction. Um, and that's part of the way you're made up and you've got to fight against that because the Lord he gives us words for correction. Some people I've met over the years in ministry that they just, they just don't listen to correction. You know, it's, it's, it's been almost, if it wasn't so tragic, it's been almost laughable. I've had couples come in, Pastor Brett, our marriage is not doing well. Okay, well, tell me about it. And they tell me kind of what's going on. And so then I kind of come up with a little bit of a bit of an answer, biblically. Well, first of all, um, maybe you shouldn't be, uh, and I could talk to the, the, the wife and you know, what she told me, maybe you shouldn't go to the bar after work and dance with other men and drink with your girlfriends after work. Well, Brett, we just think you're a legalistic. We don't like to hear what you're saying there. Well, yeah, but if, you, if you're doing things, the Bible says to abstain from even the appearance of evil. And, and a lot of people would say, yeah, if you're you know, going to the bar after work and dance with other men that's not your husband and stuff, that's probably not the best practice in marriage. Well, I think you're just judgmental. See, there's people that'll hear me give them, and I'm just gonna say it, that's wise counsel. You that are married with good marriages, amen? Amen, amen. that's wise counsel. You just heard it from a bunch of married people. <laughs> if you're going out after work, busting a move with people that's not your husband or wife, probably should stop that. Yeah. It's not a good practice. It's not for a healthy marriage. Well, we have a very open marriage. Well, yeah, you and Will Smith, that's great, but uh, it's not working out so well. It's not working out so well. That's more of a Hollywood thing, not a biblical thing. <laughs> Are you a person that just doesn't wanna hear it? It's, it's like people come for counsel and then when you give them the counsel, they just say, well, I don't wanna do that. It's amazing to me. Um, but but I've, I've only seen that just a, several thousand times, that's all. Um, so hopefully that's none of you in this room uh, who would actually, but I love Habakkuk's, he says, I'm gonna seek the Lord, I'm gonna watch and I'm gonna isolate, expect the Lord to speak, I'm gonna have patience, but I'm also gonna be open-minded to the, well, the word here is, I'm gonna um, answer when I am reproved or corrected is the idea. He's willing to be openly corrected by the Lord, I love that, it's a good posture. So you've got, uh, you know, this chapter two, watching and waiting, and, he, and that's, that verse one kind of sets the, the, the pace for all of that watching and waiting in verse one. How does he go on? Verse two, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. Um, do you remember this? We talked about this three Sundays ago um, <laughs> as our topic. And we talked about the writing of the vision for our church. And the Lord's put a very clear vision and direction for this fellowship. And uh, we've watched and waited for that. And the Lord's given that to us. We, we talked about the importance of writing down the vision for you personally as well. But I love, that's the context of this verse that we did a few weeks ago. It's such a beautiful thing. So the Lord says, write this vision. Verse three, for the vision is yet for an appointed time but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come 
it will not tarry. In other words, it may seem like a long time. It may seem like it's not happening, but it will come to pass. This is a good word. Verse three is a good word for those of us that are studying the Bible as it relates to Bible prophecy because the Lord has given us very clear distinctives of what's gonna happen in the end times. And there's a lot of people, ah, we've, we've seen, we've heard you guys talking about end times for a long time. But just this verse three is such a key. The vision is yet a, for an appointed time and it's gonna happen. And when the Lord says it's gonna happen, it will happen. And man, that's the truth about the Bible. I love this, Habakkuk gets that word from the Lord that it's gonna happen. Well, verse four, behold, his soul, which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. In other words, the Babylonian is prideful. His soul is lifted up, but the just or the justified shall live by faith. And we looked at that this last weekend, talking about this most famous phrase of the Old Testament maybe, that changed the course of the entire church uh, through the uh, reformation of the, of the church. You know, and Martin Luther, the just shall live by faith. If you missed that, you might wanna brush up on that as we covered that last week. Well, verse five, it says, yea, also because he transgresseth us by wine and he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home. Who, is, who enlargeth his desire as hell and is as death and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. We're talking about the Babylonians here. And this is an interesting little bit of prophecy that's given because it's talking about the Babylonians who just piles up nation after nation, which is exactly what they did. The Babylonians pretty much wiped out everybody. They were just piling up nations. But notice it says here, they would, because of transgression by wine. Do you remember the night the Babylonians were finally conquered? Now, if you remember Daniel chapter five, you know they were all sloshed. They were all drunk. And it would be the Medo-Persian empire led by Cyrus uh, and Darius who would come and take over the Babylonian empire. They shouldn't have been able to do it. The Babylonians were technically uh, strong enough to fend off the Medo-Persian empire. But because of their overconfidence and their pride, they got all drunk and that very night, Daniel said, this kingdom is gonna be taken from you and it was. So you can kind of check chapter five as uh, that, that happened exactly as it says here. Well, verse six, shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, woe to him that increaseth that which is not his, how long? And to him that uh, ladeth himself with thick clay, shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties for them. And now for you people from Portland area, that's um, spoil from battle, okay? Uh, the booty part there, just have to explain that to you um, that are into those kinds of things. Verse eight, because thou hast spoiled many nations and all the remnant of all the people shall spoil thee because of man's blood and for the violence of the land for the, uh, of the city and all that dwell therein. Babylon's gonna get what they dished out to others. In other words, you're gonna reap what you're sowing, Babylon. That's what Habakkuk's getting here. Um, you know, I, I kind of see uh, here in verse fifth, uh, pardon me, uh, verse uh, seven. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee? In other words, you know, you've bitten, but they're gonna rise up and bite you. It reminds me of Galatians 5.15, that the Bible just makes this as a general truth. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Um, you know, it's like whatsoever man sows, that will he also reap. Don't be deceived, God is not mocked. So the Bible talks about this over and over again. And, and basically the Babylonians are gonna get what they dish out. That, that's basically what they're gonna get. Verse nine, woe unto him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may uh, be delivered from the power of evil. Um, these guys were coveting to have the best houses, the Babylonians, to live in the nicest neighborhoods. And then he goes on about how they got those nice houses in verse 10. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and a sin against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer. In other words, the, the stones and beams of your houses are gonna cry out, you got that dishonestly. The houses that you so pridefully love, you gained it unfairly is the idea. 
Verse 12, woe unto him that buildeth a town with blood and uh, established a city by iniquity. Behold, it, uh, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So um, they're gonna weary themselves in trying to be prosperous, the Babylonians. Woe, verse 15, unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, that maketh him drunk also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Wow, heavy. The Babylonians culturally were sexually perverse and they would drug their neighbors so they could have sex with them. Sounds kind of like what happens in some of the bars and parties and stuff that happens today. It's the same sexual perversion being referred to in 15 and 16 that we're seeing today. And then he goes back to the violent theme, verse 17, for the violence, Hamas, Hebrew word, of Lebanon shall cover thee and the spoil of beasts, which made them afraid because of men's blood and for the violence of the land of the city and of all that dwell therein. So again, just uh, calling them out for their violence. And then verse 18 and 19, for their idolatry. Verse 18, what profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it? the molten image uh, and a teacher of lies that the uh, maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, awake to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver and there is no breadth at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Whew. That's heavy, man. You know, all these dumb idols that these guys are calling out to. And then Habakkuk says, but the Lord, he's in his temple and he's true. All these other idols are false. So we have a watching and a waiting. Um, number one, chapter one, a wondering and a wrestling. Number two, a watching and a waiting. Chapter three, now we see a worshiping and a witnessing as he finishes it up here. Um, worship, yes. Check out verse one. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shigionot. Huh? Shigio what? Uh, what's a Shigionot? We don't know. Um, it's probably an, a musical instrument. Uh, some scholars argue that it's a musical instrument. We, we also hear about this, by the way, in some of the other Psalms, like Psalm chapter seven, uh, David writes the song on the Shigionot. Uh, this, maybe it's an instrument. Others say, no, it's not an instrument. It's actually more of a tempo, a dynamic, uh, of, of, a, of a, like a, a cadence. Um, it's sort of like um, when we have an anthem. When we sing an anthem, that's, a, that's what most scholars believe a shigi to note is. It's like a, it's a song of victory and triumph um, is kind of the idea. So whether it's an instrument or it's a type of song of victory and triumph, we don't know for sure. Maybe it's both. Maybe you play a song of victory and triumph on a shigi note. Who knows? But um, most scholars argue about that stuff. Um, now there's another little secret about Habakkuk that's kind of interesting that some scholars speculate because of chapter three. Um, do you guys remember um, who was also a prophet um, and a priest? Does anybody remember who that was? Hello? Jeremiah moved in both of those roles in some times, some ways. Now, nobody's supposed to move in prophet, priest, and king. Remember those three? Because that's Jesus. Um, but some argue that Habakkuk may have been a priest who also moved in the role of a prophet. Um, and the reason they do that is because of this chapter three. Uh, the priests were the ones more characteristic of singing a song. And this is a song. Uh, Habakkuk chapter three is a song of Habakkuk. Um, played on an, on an instrument, perhaps. Um, and there's other evidence, perhaps, why Habakkuk may have been a priest as well. Who knows? But that's just something for you to think about. You can dig more if you want. So this is a song or a prayer of Habakkuk on, on the sigio not, this instrument or type of music. He says in verse two, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid, O Lord. Revive thy work in the midst of, thy, of the years, in the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. 
Boy, uh, you kind of hear Habakkuk saying, Lord, I know your wrath is coming, but would you please remember mercy too? Um, is that a good prayer? Is that a worthy prayer of Habakkuk? What do you think? Why do you say that? Why would it be okay for him to say, Lord, Lord, in your wrath, would you please show mercy too? Anybody wanna say so boldly, why would that be good to pray? Lord is merciful. I, what? To spare a few. The Lord doesn't destroy the righteous with the wicked, right? I mean, that's true. Um, here's the thing, what I'm, what I'm fishing for here is I just want us to see this. Um, I love that Habakkuk's praying something that we can find other verses that say the Lord is full of wrath, but he's also full of mercy. Like, like that's a biblical prayer. When I'm struggling with prayer and what to pray, I like to pray scripture. Um, I like to pray things that are biblically sound. And that's what Habakkuk, when he's saying, Lord, I know your wrath is coming, but would you also include your mercy? I love it because there's tons of scriptures that say the Lord is full of wrath, but he also, his mercy endures forever. That's a, a legitimate prayer to pray scripture. If you're ever off course or wondering how to pray, Lord, show me how to pray. Because I, I know my prayers are off, often misguided. Um, James talks about the person who prays and they don't get what they're asking for because they ask amiss. You're asking for stuff that doesn't line up with God. Um, and I love Habakkuk. He prays something that's really biblical. I wanted you to see that there in verse two. Now I'm gonna try to read this song because we're A, running out of time, but also I want you to kind of see the context of this, uh, basically verses three through 15 is, is the, the crux of the song. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. What are horns speak of? Power, right. Um, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went before his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove us under the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered and perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction and the curtain of the land of Midian did tremble. When the Lord displeased, what, pardon me, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah, which means stop and think. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee and they trembled. They, the overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thy arrows they went and uh, at the shining of thy glittering, uh, glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land of, in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation with thine anointed. Thou wouldest the, pardon me, woundest the head of, um, out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Selah. Thou didst strike through with his staves, the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great wonders. Um, verses three through uh, 15 are interesting. And I'm just gonna throw some of you people that like to go a little deeper a bone here because there's much more to chew on than what I'm gonna cover tonight. Um, but um, it, the song is considered by different people. Some people think it's prophetic. Others think it's historic. Um, th some think this is actually speaking of prophetically Jesus coming. And I'll, I'll give you like Isaiah 63. Remember um, how Jesus and the second coming, remember how he's gonna go through Basra? Remember the whole Basra thing, which is in the land of Edom? Um, and some, that's partially what's being talked about. Teman uh, there in verse three and Paran. Um, and so some people say that that's what it's talking about is when Jesus is second coming. And so a lot of this is talking about Christ and his coming uh, at, uh, at Armageddon. Others say, no, 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 this is historic. And they say it's when the law came down from Mount Sinai, which is also there in the wilderness of Paran, uh, where they believe Mount Sinai could be. 
Um, and, um, and they also believe it speaks of the, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. Um, so which one is it? Whenever I see a huge debate among scholars, oftentimes I wonder if both are true. That's kind of an interesting way to approach things. Could it be prophetic? Uh, could it be historic? It could be both. I think the Lord does that. There's dual fulfillments. We've even seen triple fulfillments of prophecy in the scripture. Um, it's like a, throwing a stone in a clear little pond and the ripple effect. Um, prophecy does roll like that. And we see it historically. Like for example, we saw that in Daniel when we read in chapter 10 and 11 about the Antiochus Epiphanes, remember him? And then we saw how Daniel's gaze suddenly went past Antiochus all the way to the very end of the world, speaking on a world leader that's coming, that is Antichrist. And it's about both, historical, but also um, prophetic. Uh, so this song is debated as far as that. But um, basically, um, you know, you can see uh, the implications of the Lord is a warrior, um, you know, and basically th saying, you know, scary things are coming. So because scary things are coming, how does Habakkuk feel? Well, that's where he comes to verse 16. He says, when I heard my belly trembled, have you ever had butterflies? I think that's what he's talking about. I had butterflies in my stomach and my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. And this would again contribute more to the local application of the Babylonians. Uh, coming. Verse 17, although the fig tree shall not blossom, interesting, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The, the labor of the olive shall fail and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. <laughs> oh, don't pack it up yet. I know it's late, but just give me a few more minutes. Um, don't you love this? First of all, although the fig tree shall not blossom. Um, when does the Bible talk about the fig tree blossoming? Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, the generation that sees the fig tree blossom. You see, this is the fig tree not blossoming. When, when the Babylonians crush Israel, there's no blossoming fig tree. But you and I are living in a day where we're seeing the fig tree that is Israel blossom. And that generation will not die off uh, before the coming of Christ. Um, what's a generation? Well, I've done whole prophecy updates and talked about what a generation might be. Um, uh, but it is an interesting day that we're living, um, blossoming in the last days, but not in Habakkuk's day. There was no blossoming going on. Um, but, but I love how he ends, he says, yet with all that stuff, my stomach's sick, my bones feel sick. Um, I see the destruction of Israel coming. With all that, he says, but, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in Jehovah. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Don't you love that? No matter what happens in your life, you and I should always verse 18 it. We should always verse 18 it. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. Um, let me, one of the fun things to do, I've mentioned this before, but is comparing the various prophets. Let me just finish with this, uh, the comparison. Uh, let's compare Jonah to Habakkuk just for a second. Interesting comparison. Jonah ministered to Nineveh. Habakkuk was ministering, if you would, to Babylon, telling them what was gonna happen to them. Jonah ran from God when he heard what, was going, what he was going to have to do. Habakkuk ran to God to find out what he was going to do. I love that about Habakkuk. Jonah saw salvation of God in the Gentiles in Nineveh. Habakkuk saw the sovereignty of God through the Gentiles of Babylon. Jonah's story ends in foolishness. Where remember he was sitting around worried about his gourd? Remember that? <laughs> Habakkuk's story ends in faith as he says, I'm gonna put my trust in the Lord. Jonah had to learn about his ministry uh, inside the belly of a fish. Habakkuk learned in the high tower on his knees, seeking the Lord and watching and waiting. You see, I like to compare these two because you can either be a Habakkuk or you can be Jonah. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna learn in worship or learn out in the world? Are you gonna learn here in the sanctuary or are you gonna learn out in the storm? You know, it's kind of a choice we have to make. How are you gonna roll? 
And oh Lord, help us to be more of a Habakkuk who's just seeking the Lord and doesn't always know everything that's going on, but seek the Lord, watching, waiting, being patient, submitting to the Lord. And then even if we don't know everything, still saying, but man, the Lord is our strength. He's the one we're gonna put our trust in. I love Habakkuk. This is a tiny little minor prophet that packs a powerful punch in the Bible. I I love the book of Habakkuk. Um, May the Lord help us to have a Habakkuk mindset, amen? Amen. Oh Lord, how thankful we are for your word. Once again, these little minor prophets pack a powerful punch. And I pray that it would leave an impact on our hearts and our minds, Lord, and that we would like Habakkuk, we would seek you and wait upon you. And, and even as Habakkuk lived in sort of last days of Israel, we find ourselves in similar conditions today in the, the days we're living. Help us to be joyful Help us to have peace in our hearts, even though things might seem troubling. Lord, we know you are the one who's gonna take care of all these things. So help us put our trust in you. Help us to represent you well and serve you and walk with you during these dark times. Uh, Lord, bless these, your people, who have taken time on a Wednesday night to study your word. May it bring good fruit in their lives, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.